So this morning we're picking back up in the Gospel of John, and we're talking uh, in this area it'll be about Jesus teaching in the temple. We'll be focusing in John chapter 7, verses 10 through 53. Prior to this, going through John chapter 6, this is where Jesus was expressing the fact that partaking of the Son is the only way to have eternal life. He's talking about eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. Of course, in the context, it's very clear he's talking about spiritual things, not physical things. And he even expresses that. Many of the disciples at this time don't understand what Jesus is talking about. Um, they really take it more of it as a fleshly or from a fleshly perspective. And as a result of that, they actually leave. So a substantial amount of his disciples leave. Now, the 12 actually do stay. And, you know, Christ is talking to them about this, and the reality is, as they express, you know, they know that Jesus is the one who, who has the words of eternal life. They know that he's the Son of God, although they didn't understand really what he was saying. It's like, where, where are we going to go? We know you are the one who has the words of eternal life. So it's a, one of those things where oftentimes in the Old Testament, you especially see this with Mary, where she didn't understand it, so she'd put it in her heart and just wait and see, you know, what what is he talking about here? You know, and it's the same thing with them. So we have the 12, uh, and really it's the 11 who stayed because the 12th one stayed because he wanted the money. He wasn't, he wasn't there because uh, Jesus was Christ, and that would be Judas. And then it goes on uh, in John to talk about Jesus' brothers and that they do not actually believe that he is Christ at this time. And they really kind of goad him into going into Jerusalem and presenting himself publicly as the Messiah. Well, Jesus says, it's not my time to do that yet. You know, which if you actually follow scripture, Daniel gives us a very specific time of when the Messiah is going to enter in in that way. But it wasn't his time yet not for that type of an entry. So he didn't go with his brothers down to the feast. However, Jesus does go up to the Feast of Tabernacles in John chapter 7, verse 10, which this is the one that his brothers were um, talking about him going and publicly displaying himself as the Messiah. Now he goes, but he doesn't go in a public way. He goes secretly. That is, he, again, he's not he's not sneaking around, but he's not presenting himself publicly as the Messiah at this point. Not coming in with trumpets blazing and all of that kind of stuff would be more of the focus there. So now the Feast of Tabernacles, this is celebrated at the time of harvest, because just prior to this, we had the Passover, and Christ did something at the Passover that really upset the Jews. And you remember what that was? He healed the man, and he healed the man on the Sabbath, and that really upset the Jews. So we're still, we still have this attitude from the Jews at this point, upset them so much that they wanted to actually put him to death because he broke the Sabbath. So it begins, the, the feast here begins on the 15th day of Tishri, which would be late September to late October, and it runs for seven days. And we see this over in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 34, where it talks about this, where actually Israel is specifically given this feast. Jesus does not go up in the way that his brothers suggested. So, of course, like I said, his brothers are like, oh, you got to go up and you, you know, if, if you're really the Messiah, you go up and present yourself as, as the Messiah. But Jesus didn't go up that way. And when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, as it were, in secret. That is, again, he's not um, announcing himself to be the Messiah at this point. He's really not making a stir at all. Now, he is going to present himself as the Messiah, but he does it in a very interesting way, not so much publicly. They want Jesus to present himself as the Messiah, like I said, in a public display. This is what his brothers want. But it was not time for the Messiah to be cut off. And we see over in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, where after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So scripture is actually talking about the fact that the Messiah would be cut off. And Jesus, his response to his brothers is, is not time. 
it's not that Jesus is afraid. He's just like, this isn't the appropriate time for me to do this yet. And as it goes on, then the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. This was already prophesied about before Christ even came. Now, the Jews did seek out Jesus at the feast. So a lot of the Jews were looking for where is Jesus at? Because, of, of course, some news had spread about what he was doing. He had started his ministry. He started with the healing of a man. And they were not able to actually find him, even though they wanted to. You know, and this would be, uh, as they're looking for it here, looking for him here in John chapter 7 and verse 11, then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? Now, again, he's there, but he's not there in a very public, open way. That's not the way he came up. There was a lot of grumbling among the saints concerning Jesus at this point, excuse me, among the Jews um, at this particular time also, and we see that in verse 12. And there was much complaining, and your word complaining really means grumbling. Among the people concerning him, some said he is good, others said no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. So there is some conflicts about who Jesus is and what he's doing. Now, remember, this primarily stems off the fact that Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath day. So you have some saying, but he healed a man. And then others are like, but it was on the Sabbath. So he can't be a good man because he did it on the Sabbath. And the other ones are like, but he healed a man. <laughs> you can't do that unless you're actually good. So this is kind of the conflict you're getting between the Jews as they're discussing Jesus. No one dared to speak openly about this, though. At this point already, and likely again, we're, we're really only a few months away from when his ministry actually started, and now he's again presenting himself as a Messiah. Well, he'll be doing it here shortly as he's teaching in the temple. But they're already the leaders of Israel were just like, you don't even mention his name or we're going to kick you out. They were afraid of him. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now, the Jews would be a reference to the leaders, probably more specifically at this time to the Pharisees, because they were the ones, they were the group that was in the majority within the leaders of Israel. Jesus teaches in the temple during the Feast of the Tabernacle now. So, like I said, it's not that Jesus is not is um, refusing to present himself as the Messiah. He's just not going up in the way that his brothers actually were saying he should go up. But he still is coming to Israel, and he still is going to show Israel that he actually is the Messiah. And we see as here he starts to teach in the temple. John chapter 7, verses uh, 14 through 29. So in, in 14, it says, at about the middle of the feast, Jesus goes up to the temple to teach. So this would be on Wednesday, approximately. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and he taught. And the Jews marveled at Jesus teach, at his teaching because he was not taught the letter. Okay. In John chapter 7 and verse 15 and the Jews marveled, and likely the Jews here, by the way, would be a reference to the leaders of Israel, not just all the Jews, saying, how does this man know letters, having never studied? How does he know words, but yet he's never studied? Now, how would they know that? He did not study in the schools in Jerusalem, is really what they're saying. Did... Um, well, you look at the the timeline and the history and what's going on. For a Jewish child who was not in Jerusalem, would they go to school? They absolutely would, because they went to synagogue. And what did you do at synagogue? You learned. You definitely learned how to read, because you had to be able to read, because you know when it was your time to get up and actually read scripture, you had to be able to read it. So they're not saying he can't read Hebrew, because all of the Hebrews would be able to do that. They're saying he's not a man of the, of the letter. He's not a scribe. 
yeah, it would be like, you know, he didn't, how, how could he possibly be teaching this? He didn't come from our schools, our, our, our religious training schools that would be in Jerusalem. Now, this is not the first time, or the, well, this would be probably in the first time in recording, but there are other times where they actually have an issue with people who weren't trained in their schools. Another area we see this is a reaction with Peter and John. Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Now, the interesting part about here is uneducated and untrained does not mean that they were vile fishermen who had no education at all. It really means they were ones who did not study in Jerusalem. That's their primary focus here. The doctrine of Jesus is speaking is actually from God. And Jesus expresses that. Now, he is actually teaching doctrine here, which means information that is to be learned and put into practice. For Israel, the information that God that Jesus was actually presenting to him, them is was actually for their practice. This is where a lot of confusion comes with Matthew chapter 5, where you have 5 through 7, which is the um, Sermon on the Mount. It is doctrine. It is doctrine to be practiced, but it is not doctrine for the church. It's doctrine for Israel during the millennial kingdom. And there is a very clear distinction there. You can start out with the fact that who is Jesus actually speaking to? And you cannot say he's speaking to Christians because there are no Christians at this time. Because when did Christians come into existence, shall we say? Yeah, after the resurrection of Christ. So you can't claim the church. So he's not speaking to the church. He's speaking to Israel. And he is speaking about the uh, what is to come. And that's the during the millennial kingdom. <clears throat> so John chapter 7 and verse 16 says, And Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but he who sent me. So again, he's referencing you know, what he's teaching. What he's uh, instructing them on is from God. Those who desirously will to do, or those who desire to do the desirous will of God, will know whether Jesus' doctrine is from him or from God. Because they're going to understand that it actually is from God if they listen to him. If anyone wills to do his will, and that would be God's desirous will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. The one seeking the glory of the one who sent him has no unrighteousness in him. So when the messenger is coming, is the messenger seeking his own glory? Or is he seeking the glory of the one who sent him? Because there's a big difference there. Unfortunately, we get a lot of people who they, as the messenger, claim glory. But they don't focus on the one who actually was, uh, who sent them where Jesus is saying he's focusing on the one who sent him. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. Now, remember, glory means uh, to have an opinion of someone. And typically, it is a proper opinion when you correctly glorify somebody. It's to have or to hold a proper opinion of someone. Well, this particular person is seeking to put himself forward, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and no unrighteousness is in him. Then Jesus, call, he calls them out for trying to kill him. Now, of course, in saying this, you know, what is their response? Because did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keep the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Now, the, the Jews here um, it really aren't the ones who are responding. It seems more like the people in general are the ones who are responding, that are talking to him, and they hear him saying this. And they're like, um, there's nobody trying to kill you. What, are you. what are you talking about? But actually, the leaders of Israel were trying to kill him. John chapter 7, verse 20, the people answered and said, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. They thought he was crazy. Jesus calls them out for their negative reaction to him healing on the Sabbath now. 
And this is where it's going to come about to where they're going to realize, oh, yeah, he's the one that they're actually wanting to kill because of that. John chapter 7, verse 21 through 24. Jesus did one work and they marveled. And this is in verse 21. Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work and you marveled. It, it stunned them. Circumcision and the Mosaic law he then brings up. And this is in 7, 22 through 23. And he says, Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from the Father. So he gave you circumcision. And you circumcised the man on the Sabbath. Now, if they circumcised the man on the Sabbath, what would be the significance of or urgency thereof to circumcise a person? If you were not circumcised, you would be cut off from the people. So there is actually an importance, especially if somebody becomes a proselyte. It's like, oh, you have to be circumcised. You must be circumcised now. And they would do that on the Sabbath. Okay. So really, when you understand the context here, they're basically in their attitude saying the salvation of this person is worth more than obeying the Mosaic law from their perspective. Especially when they say, well, Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. And, oh, no, you can't do that. But yet they're doing this exact same thing, really. They're saving a person in that sense. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I've made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Now, I healed the man on the Sabbath, and now you're all upset, but yet you have no problem with circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses is not broken. Complete contradiction, really. They are to judge the things with righteousness not by appearance, in verse 24. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Look at the truth. The people from Jerusalem then question if the leaders know Jesus is the Messiah. Because now they're all, well, wait a minute, we're beginning to understand who he is now. And, and why nobody dares to speak the name of Jesus in among the Jews, because they're going to basically be kicked out of the synagogues because the leaders have decided that they have decreed it so here the people from jerusalem question if the leaders know that jesus is the messiah they recognize jesus as the one the jews are, are seeking to kill now and this is in verse 25 now some of them from jerusalem said is this not he whom they seek to kill and now the people, like I said, they're all suddenly realizing, oh, okay, I see what he's actually referring to and who he is. Because otherwise they were like, oh, you're crazy. Nobody's trying to kill you. They are astonished that Jesus is speaking boldly in the temple. These are the Jews from Jerusalem. So there's not all of the Jews at this time were actually from Jerusalem. So not all of the Jews at this time during the feast would have understood or would have had the history about what happened. But there are some of them that did, and they're like, he's the one they want. They wanted to kill him, but yet now he's in the temple preaching, or in this case, he's actually teaching. But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Messiah? They know where Jesus is from and therefore question how he could be the Messiah. So this would be the same Jews where they're like, oh, but, but we don't understand how he could actually be the Messiah. However, we know where this man is from, but when the, but when the Christ come, no one knows where he's from. Now, is that actually true? It's actually not entirely accurate. And they contradict themselves pretty quickly because they're like, well, he comes from Bethlehem, which would mean you know where he's coming from. Okay. But really their focus is, but this is, this is a man from Nazareth. We know Jesus. Probably generally know about him. You know. And then Jesus addresses their concerns here in verses 28 through 29. Um, and then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying, You both know me and you know where I am from. 
And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. So he's addressing the issue that they're having. They're like, yeah, you know where I came from, but I'm not out here presenting or pushing myself forward as the Messiah. I'm actually teaching you the doctrine related to the one who actually sent me. I'm giving you information regarding the one who sent me. Now, again, this is how Jesus typically presented himself to Israel. We can learn a lot as Christians. We really can. Because Jesus' primary focus was what when it came to presenting the fact that he was the Messiah? His actions, not his words. To the point to where there's some people, because they don't really understand what Jesus was saying, will try to go back in, in Scripture and say, that well, Jesus never said he was the Messiah. Well, there are a few instances where he specifically said, yes, he is the Messiah. But the majority of the time, no. He did not say he was the Messiah. He healed a man. <laughs> I mean, seriously, think about that. He showed through his actions that he is actually the Messiah. He did things that nobody had ever done from the beginning of, of the creation of humans. He healed a man that didn't even have eyes. Do you, does he really need to say, oh, and by the way, I'm the Messiah? <laughs> but so often that that's the focus. Well, he didn't say it. No, he proved it through his actions. And what he's talking about here is he is coming. And yeah, they know where he's from, but he's not coming presenting himself as the Messiah. By the way, that's what his brothers wanted him to do. Go announce yourself as a Messiah. You know, also, and a lot of times we don't get this in Scripture, we get it through extra biblical um, historical records and stuff like that. There was a lot of people claiming to be the Messiah at this time. Jesus wasn't the only one who was claiming. You know, I mean, think about it. John is coming and saying, make way the make straight the way of the Lord. False teachers are going to jump all over that and say, oh, you know, I'm the, I'm the Messiah. And, they, and many have been, were led out to the, the wilderness and were destroyed by following their false Messiah. Now, no doubt these were the ones coming and saying, I'm the Messiah. They were presenting themselves forward. Jesus isn't doing that. Is that I'm not here to push myself forward. I'm here because of the one who sent me, and I'm giving this information regarding that. So it doesn't really matter that you know where I'm from. Pay attention to what I'm doing. Now, the leaders of Israel at this time, they're going to seek to take Jesus. And take is a term that means they're going to take him by force. They want to get him out of the temple and lock him up. John chapter 7, verse 30 through 36. They sought to hate to take him. But his hour had not yet come, so they weren't permitted. God wasn't going to allow this at this point. Therefore, they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And it was a little confusing, by the way, as, as we see it played out to the Pharisees as to why nobody was willing to take Jesus. And then they start throwing all kinds of accusations against each other. So many of the people believed he is actually the Messiah now. The way that he's speaking, the actions that he's done, the verification, no doubt, from other Jews that he actually did indeed heal a man on the Sabbath day. And he made the man completely whole. Likely, the man was there and he could say, yeah, I'm the one he did this to. And everybody knows what condition I was in because he had been in that condition, what was it, over 30 years, 37 years? Yeah, 37 years he had been in that condition. So they knew who he was. And many of the people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? Now, the healing on the Sabbath was the only, wasn't the only one he had done. He had done quite a lot of them. As a matter of fact, the very first one he did was turning the water into wine. You know, and that was, you know, really the, the servants of the household would have started talking about that, saying, hey, we know full well this was actually water that we put in there. 
And I would bet after the uh, master of the feast tasted it, the servants probably tasted it too, because they're like, no, that's water. He's got to be drunk. And they taste it, and they're like, no, that's wine. That is something really interesting. Not to mention the feeding of over 5,000 people. Now, when, when he fed 5,000 people, which that would be just the males, so uh, we're upwards of 15 plus thousand people. Not that the number means anything. Because what was their response? He feeds them all, and there's 12 baskets left over of food. Feeds them all, and their response is, oh, you got we got to make you our king. Well, because Moses, you know, he, he, gave, he gave the Israelites some manna in the wilderness. What's their focus? Free food. <laughs> I don't have to go out and work for my food. You know, where Jesus did not allow that. And then he, of course, instructs them, hey, you need to be paying attention to the food that isn't physical food, the spiritual things. So all of this information, you know, as they're talking among each other, they're seeing that the leaders are actually not really doing anything about Jesus' teaching in the temple at this point. They're like, well, maybe he is actually the Messiah. The people are starting to believe as they see this. So now the Pharisees no doubt hear this, and they, and they send officers to take him. John chapter 7 and verse 32. Then the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent off officers to take him. Because, of course, they don't want this type of, uh, they don't want the people believing this. They want to control the people. Why does this so sound familiar in, in so many times in history? People in leadership positions that really have usurped their position do exactly the same thing. You know, send send the police in to take out the person who's speaking the truth because we don't want people to actually understand the truth. And it's doing the same thing. Jesus stated that he will only be with them for a little while then. So there, the officers are there. They're coming to take him. And Jesus is still talking. He says, well, I'm only going to be here for a little while. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I will go to him who sent me. Now, when Jesus goes, they're not going to be able to find him because they cannot, that is, they do not have the inherent ability to actually go there. You will seek me and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. And, and this word cannot is you don't have the inherent ability to actually come. And, of course, the Jews' response to this is, is he going to the Gentiles? Because that's where the, the Jews wouldn't go to the Gentiles. They, there's no way they would go out to the Gentiles. So actually, if Jesus did go to the Gentiles, they wouldn't go after him because, you know, there's a, those are filthy Gentiles. They're not going to have anything to do with that, especially the Pharisees and the leaders of Israel would not uh, would react that way. So they didn't really understand what he was actually saying. They didn't understand, and they should have, that he's going to go to the one who sent him, which what did he say prior? Where did he come from? The one who came from above, John chapter 3. Remember John chapter 3, by the way, and we did talk about that going through there, but remember that in John chapter 3, the word born again does not actually exist in that passage. In that whole chapter, that word isn't there. Everywhere you get born again, it's, from, it's born from above. Now, we are actually born again over in second, first and second Peter, especially, but other passages very clearly show that we are actually born again. Titus chapter three, verse five talks about that. But in John chapter three, he's not saying born again. He's saying you have to be born from above and that he was the one who came from above. And now he's saying it's not going to be very long that I'm going to go back to the one who sent me. And when I go back to the one who sent me, you're not going to be able to find me. Kind of a hint. You better start seeking now. And by the way, what was uh, at this time still, how did humans, how, what was the, for lack of a better term, what was the gospel message? Seeking God. Yeah. You are to seek God. And, and, and I say for lack of a better term, because... Prior to our current gospel, 
because we have a very specific message, and this is a message that relates to the church. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 talk about this, specifically 16. So in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, it says the gospel of the Christ has the inherent ability to save a person. This has not been true throughout history. That is, prior really to the, the dispensation of grace, there wasn't a specific message that would save a person. Jesus even talks about this with the parable of the sower of the seed, where he talks about the one who sows on different grounds, different types of ground. Or, you know, in, in some cases where you have the crows coming and taking the seeds, um, they would actually, the seed was planted and Satan would come and take it from their heart, which means they received the message, but it was actually taken out, whether through cares or other things that Satan would actually uh, influence them. You know, Satan can't influence a person today that actually receives the gospel. This is why there's so many false gospels out there. Why uh, so many predominant churches will teach that, oh, you have to accept Jesus as Lord of your life. Satan, can, can he's okay with that. Why? Because that's not the gospel that saves you. That's really a gospel that's focused on works. The same thing with accepting Jesus into your heart. Now, there are some people that say accepting Jesus into your heart, and what they actually mean is believed that he died for our sins and he was raised from the dead. So why wouldn't you just say that instead? Because saying Jesus, accept Jesus into your heart can mean so many different things to so many different people. It's not a clear message. So we have a clear message now, a very clear message, but the Jews didn't understand what Jesus was talking about back here. So then the Jews said among themselves, where does he intend to go? that we shall not find him. Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the, the Greeks and teach the Greeks? I remember Greeks is synonymous with Gentiles. That's the way it's actually used. What is this thing that he said, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? So, you know, they're a little confused at this point. They're like, wait a minute, I'm not understanding why he's saying this. Although technically they've had enough information to know this. So now there's a dispute among the leaders concerning Jesus. Because, of course, they've sent officers to actually arrest him, basically, and escort him out of the temple. But the officers are we're going to see they're not going to do that. On the last day of the feast, Jesus gives the people an opportunity to come to him in John chapter 7, verse 37. So on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now, he is speaking concerning the Holy Spirit. Now, he previously spoke again about this when he was talking about, you have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And in the context, he very clearly says he's talking about spiritual things. Sadly, we even have people today who don't understand that, and they want to say that communion is literally the flesh of Christ and the blood of Christ, and that is completely contrary to what Scripture says. That's not what communion is about. And that's not what he was talking about in drinking his blood and eating his flesh. So now he's saying, hey, if you're thirsty, come to me. Is he going to give them all a drink of water? He's talking about water. Or really, he's talking about that which refreshes life. And that's why he's using the term water. But he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, this is, of course, the when he's uh, referred to this with the Samaritan woman. What did she say? Well, give me this living water so I don't have to come to this well and, and continue to draw water. She took it as a normal fleshly thing, not understanding it's a spiritual thing. You know, the reality is a Christian is not one who lives a life that is completely separated from God. Even Christians who are actually not acting like they should 
still are able to get refreshment from the Holy Spirit that now indwells them, because every time they start to act according to who they are, they're going to be tasting of that fresh water and being revived. That spiritual life is what he's talking about here. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those who believed in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit had not yet uh, was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. There's some significance in that too, because was the Holy Spirit working with them at this time? Actually, he was. You know that uh, the Holy Spirit came and resided on Christ in his uh, baptism. Why did the Holy Spirit come and reside on Christ in his baptism? That's an anointing. So Jesus has the anointing of the Holy Spirit on him at this point. And he does talk to the disciples pre uh, later in John chapter 15 and, and on as he's talking to them. He tells them that the Holy Spirit has been with you this whole time. You know him. But there's going to be a change. He's now going to be in you, not just with you. He's going to indwell us. And this is what he's talking about. But in this way, the Holy Spirit hasn't been set yet because Jesus hasn't been glorified. And of course, when we get into John chapter 15, he'll talk about that. He's saying, I have to go away so I can send the, the Spirit. If I don't go away, I can't send the Spirit. And this is another comforter that's actually going to come. So this is very necessary that we go away. Now, the crowd, of course, in, in response to this is very divided. In verse uh, 40, verses 40 through 41, it talks about this. And it says, Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, truly, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Messiah. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Now, again, they go back to, but wait a minute, he comes from Nazareth. Coming out of Galilee. Christ doesn't, he doesn't actually come from there. Interestingly enough, when we were actually looking at that, remember the word Nazareth is actually the Hebrew word for branch. And scripture does actually say that the branch will come, which is quite interesting. And it's also very interesting that the city of Nazareth, really, we don't even know where it's at. They assume they found the well, but they're not really sure. So it wasn't really a place that was preserved because they didn't understand this is where the Messiah was coming from. But Christ was actually born in Bethlehem. Just as scripture said, he would come out. He would come out of Bethlehem. But they have a problem with this. They're like, mm, you know. And of course, when they're saying the prophet, what are they referencing here? The prophet goes back to what Moses said. A prophet will rise up from your brethren likened to me. He was talking about the Messiah. Now, some would take him as, oh, maybe the Messiah isn't the prophet. Maybe the Messiah is going back to referencing what the promise given to David, not connecting the two together correctly, that that would be the same one in what they're expressing. Now, they expect the Messiah to come from Bethlehem, like I said, in John chapter 7, verse 42. Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? Now, didn't they just previously say nobody knows where the actual Messiah is coming from? <laughs> and now they're quoting scripture of exactly where he comes from. They weren't really having an issue with the fact that nobody knows. They were having an issue with the fact that Jesus didn't come with a whole lot of fanfare and presenting himself as the Messiah. Oh, when he comes back, by the way, it's going to be a whole lot of fanfare. And what do I mean by that? When Christ, when the second coming of Christ, when he steps his foot upon this earth, what is he going to do? everybody's going to know he's the Messiah. There's going to be absolutely no question about that because he will utterly destroy his enemies and set up his kingdom. That's what the Jews were expecting. They weren't expecting somebody who was timid and, well, they presented the truth, but they weren't really after everybody recognizing who they were. They weren't, they weren't expecting somebody who was focusing on the message that in a message from the Father, they were expecting somebody to present themselves as the Messiah. No, that's not what it, that's not what it was. And like I said, they really did know where he was supposed to come from. So they were divided here. 
So those who wanted to take Jesus could not. So because of the crowd here, we've got a very large crowd, and it's kind of divided. So if they go to try to arrest Jesus, what do you think is going to happen? Some of them might be picking up some stones, you know. So they were like, uh, maybe we did. And multiple times, the, the leaders of Israel were afraid of the people and wouldn't do things because of the people. So there was a division among the people because of him. Now, some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. No one touched him. And therefore, the officers who were there to take him returned without Christ. And this presents a problem because the chief priests and, and the Pharisees are going to question the officers. You know, it's like, we sent you to go get him. Why did you not get him? In verse 45, then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? Now, the officers are going to respond concerning Christ because, of course, they're sitting there listening to him as they're getting, they're waiting for an opportunity to actually take him. And the officer said, no man ever spoke like this. So they were actually listening, and they're like, oh, this is, the one you're talking about is taking, the, nobody speaks in the way that he's speaking. He's talking about things that they, well, they understood that he was talking about a message from God. The Pharisees then accused the officers of being deceived. Oh, how often those in, you know, in leadership positions, when you don't agree with them, they well, we got a big campaign of misinformation, which is not misinformation. It's accurate information. It just misses what they're trying to present. And that's exactly what they were doing here. They're like, oh, are you deceived? Do you believe that he's the Messiah? Do you not believe us? John chapter 7, verse 47 through 48. Then the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? Well, actually, it ends up a whole lot of them did actually believe, but they wouldn't say anything. But at this point, they're not presenting the fact that he's a Messiah. You don't have that. And the Pharisees then speak against the people in verse 49. But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. So now they're saying, oh, well, these people, they don't understand. The, they don't understand the Mosaic law. They don't understand what was written. They're all just cursed because of the, of, of the fact that they're believing that Jesus is the Messiah. But Nicodemus now speaks up. He's like, whoa, wait a minute. You're accusing a man before he's even been judged. You know, he's calling them out for their hypocrisy. Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? Because again, the, the Pharisees, the way they're presenting this, is they've already judged him to be an unrighteous man, but he's never presented, he's never been before them and presented what he was doing. He's never been given an opportunity to give a defense. And when he is given an opportunity to give a defense, what do the Pharisees end up doing? Bringing in a bunch of false, uh, false, um, well, whatever you call them, witnesses, false witnesses and um, people who couldn't even agree with their own statements to try to actually get, they didn't give him an opportunity to, to truly present a legal argument against their accusations. Not at all. And they weren't about to do it here. But remember who Nicodemus is at this point, at this time, Nicodemus is the teacher of Israel. So this isn't just somebody who's speaking up in the crowd. This is the man that everybody should be listening to who's speaking up in the crowd. And he's saying, hey, does our law actually judge a man before the, the, he is heard? That's not according to the Mosaic law. Then, of course, what, is, what happens? Now, this is where you see why most of the time the, the people were afraid to speak up, even the leaders, because the Pharisees then attack Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel at this time. They start to attack him. They answer and said to him, are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has risen out of Galilee. So basically, you know, and it's kind of vile in their response. So they're going to disagree, and due to their disagreement, they're going to end up dispersing. You know, all of them are just going to end up 
go into their own homes because they don't really agree with each other. And everyone went to his own house. So they're having a disagreement here. And Nicodemus calls them out for the law. And of course, they're saying, we are ones who actually understand the law. Yet Nicodemus is saying, but you're not abiding by the law. They didn't like that. So we got this argument going on. And then everybody just kind of disperses at this point and basically leaves it as it is. Jesus is still in the temple. They're not touching him. Not at this point. And the reason they're not doing that is because it's not his time. 